on indicate if they can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, hi, Tayo. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and for your patience, for registering and for taking out the time today. Um, thank you for registering for the webinar this evening. I hope you're having a lovely weekend so far. And the theme of our, my name is, oh yeah, let me begin properly. My name is Desire Uba and I'm a YP in Lagos. I am a member of the Education and Training Committee. So I will be moderating this session for today. Let's get right into it because we're kind of you know, short of time. Our theme for this webinar today is maximizing the capacity of pharmacists in healthcare. And it is an expose on vaccination. Why did we pick this? We, with the advent of the COVID vaccine coming in, it gave us an opportunity to look into what it is that pharmacists can really do when it comes to vaccination. In other countries, pharmacists take a huge role you know, in vaccination, but in Nigeria, not so much yet. So we want to know how is it, what is the issue? How can we take this on? Are there any steps that we can take? Are there any things that we can learn? So that's why we have our two amazing facilitators today who will teach us and who will discuss with us really about what the opportunities are realistically and also um, looking into the future. All right. So that's what our webinar today is about. Today we have two facilitators, Dr. Emmanuel Ebroko and Farm Ezene. So today we're starting with Farm we're starting with Farm Emmanuel today. Dr. Emmanuel is a pharmacist. He is a social entrepreneur and innovator, inventor with vast business acumen and people skills. He holds a certificate in project management in global health from the University of Washington and has obtained a certificate in nonprofit leadership and management from the Lagos State Business, Lagos business School, Pan Atlantic University. He's an alumnus of MERS Discovery District of the Ontario Network of Entrepreneurs Program in Canada and Faith Foundation Aspiring Entrepreneurs Program in Nigeria. Dr. Ebroko is a Tony Elumelu Foundation entrepreneur, a fellow of the President Obama Young African Leadership Initiative, a fellow of Leap Africa, and a One Young World Ambassador. He holds a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree and a Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the prestigious University of Benin, Benin City, Edo State. He formed Inoculate as he's the founder and executive director because he believes that we can reduce deaths due to preventable diseases to the barest minimum. And he lives his life chasing that dream. Personally, I've been in trainings with where Dr. Ebroko has spoken. And yes, actually he is passionate about preventable diseases, especially in Africa. So, we have Dr. Emmanuel here now, and he's about to, you know, give us his presentation, or rather, he says he's going to discuss with us YPs. So, Dr. Emmanuel, we're ready for you. Okay, thanks very much, your Desire. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thanks for that intro. So, it's a pleasure being here uh, to giving this uh, giving this opportunity to actually uh, discuss. Uh, with YPs on how pharmacy could uh, unless uh, the potentials they have, which is uh, the untapped values uh, to solve problems in the vaccination, vaccination space. Okay, so I will just proceed. Uh, what I will just let us know is, um, I'm just here to actually awaken that giant in us, you understand, that uh, to lighten that uh, fire, that passion, so that we could know the, 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 the capacity we have the skills, the knowledge to actually solve uh, the problems in the vaccination space, which means uh, we need to help people prevent diseases. That's a very uh, uh, a team we can't do without. And uh, the time is now. Here's the perfect timing, you understand? There's always a point you have to go to a market with a solution. And irrespective of the difficulties uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic brought, it also came with a whole lot of opportunities. You understand? So that's basically why I'm here. And every time I speak, I always uh, try to ensure uh, the truth comes out. Uh, what I just want to do here, like I said, is to, is to spark the minds, the young minds that could actually uh, create this desired change uh, we want in society. 
So what I would tell you, uh, you is that I want us to be self-aware of what we have and to actually discover the potentials uh, we have in solving problems in, in society. So permit me on this point to actually uh, take off my hat as a pharmacist and put on uh, my hat as a social entrepreneur, uh, because that's basically why I've been operating for, for years now. So I'll be speaking from the angle of your SWOT analysis. Let's, let's uh, do the SWOT of ourselves. What's our strengths? What's our weakness? Where are the opportunities and, and the threats that, that wants to prevent us from achieving our, our vision of uh, helping society, right? So we have to analyze all these things, you understand? Uh, until we know who, who you are, <laughs> you remain a stranger to others, right? So the way you, you price yourself is also the way people will cost you. So I will start with the strengths. What are the strengths? I would love to take us back. Mind you, this is not a, a, lec this is not a lecture. It's, this is we having a discourse. It's uh, we trying to actually look at what we already have. So the first strength I want, to, I want us to discuss about is, is your philosophy as a pharmacist, your philosophy. What are the principles you were trained with? What are the principles you believe in? You understand? What is your mindset? So we all know that the, the philosophy of medicine is health. Uh, the philosophy of law is justice. Education is truth. What's the philosophy of pharmacy? I could recall them, a lecturer told me it's pharmaceutical care. You understand? Which is, which is a patient-centered care uh, and outcome-oriented. And to, for you to be able to achieve this, uh, you need to build good rapport, good relationship. Practically from vaccination experience, with our relationship, uh, people won't build trust. Majority of the work we do on my team is because we've been able to establish relationship with people. That's why we could get them vaccinated. We're able to build trust. So we are not spending much time uh, combating. You can't combat vaccine hesitancy. Or, or solve the problem of anti-vaxxers if you can establish trust with the community. So one of pharmacists have been trained uh, with the ability to actually build relationship with people in the community to serve. When we talk about innovation, I see pharmacists as the main brains behind a whole lot of innovation because right now we talk about human-centered design thinking, which is the perfect way to solve problems for people. Pharmacy started that through pharmaceutical care, which is patient-centered, you understand? We started designing solutions to suit a patient lifestyle, using the budget they have to solve, be it the economic expenditure, to solve clinical problems, to ensure uh, we achieve human, humanistic outcomes for them. So as regards vaccination, that's a key strength, you understand? Your ability to create rapport with, with people, to communicate with them, build relationship with them. You understand? What, that relationship, communicates with empathy. Pharmacy have it. That's a real core strength. You understand? Let me give, a, give an example. Uh, we're having a problem of maybe bad, poor communication. A mother goes to a health uh, center. She knows basically that her, her child is going to experience a whole lot of pain from the vaccination process, right? She knows that. And while even the environment is crowded, it's stuffy, she has been there for a long while, she's frustrated. Then finally, she walks over for the child to be vaccinated. Then the uh, frontline health worker there addresses her poorly, embarrasses her. But if we should juxtapose with, uh, with the pharmacy, you, you see that if this uh, mother, this client is there, uh, this beneficiary to actually get the baby vaccinated, with the way the pharmacy would address her, communicate empathetically in a way that, that, that both of them are on the same uh, emotional frequency, she will feel more relaxed, right? So why is this important? If you, you, you address this model poorly, you understand, and you know you need to come back next four weeks time for the subsequent vaccination, the mother within her start weighing the the, the, the benefits, the, the pain of going there to take an embarrassment, waiting long time, compared to uh, the benefits of the vaccine that she can't actually even see with her eyes because it's a service. She might end up not going, which means she become non adherent she become vaccine hesitant. You understand, vaccine hesitancy is not just that people are talking about vaccines are these, vaccines are that. It's also about um, access 
is, is there a pain trying to access that? You understand? So indirectly, this uh, health worker have created a vaccine assistant person. So the mother might not necessarily come back because the relationship and trust wasn't well established. But and later on, you might see the child, since the child is not well vaccinated, might contract this disease and maybe die from it. You understand, which is painful. But with pharmacies that already has this potential to, to create good relationship, build good rapport, establish trust, we're talking about vaccine hesitancy. It's a very easy thing to compare to that level because practically speaking from my field experience, that's what we do. We build relationship with people even before they get vaccinated for like six months, taking all questions they have, answering them, being there for them. We build a trust that even at the end, we become like families. We always let them know we are families now. You understand the people that could do that better is the community pharmacies. Hospital pharmacy is there, but the people that could do it better at the community pharmacy. So that's a core strength you know, we can uh, do without. We already have that. So secondly, accessibility. Let me give an example. Um, let's, this is no more of a religious thing, but let's see it this way. I love to for ask this was when Lazarus, for example, was seriously critically healed. Uh, Mary, Mary Magdalene, they, they tried reaching out to Jesus, you understand? Like, where's the master? Try to maybe then let me assume the police mobile calls to him and all that. Hello, okay. They placed uh, mobile calls to him or they tried contacting him, but it wasn't really um, accessible. You understand? It wasn't really accessible. Then three days later, he, showed, he shows up and they told him that <laughs> Lazarus is dead right, is dead. If only you were here, it would have lived. So we are having access problem. Access is a big uh, problem, you understand? So let, me, let me create a picture for you why, how big this is. It's a big problem. So the federal government for Nigeria funds uh, hepatitis B vaccination, for example, for, on the five children, which was introduced in 2004. But they don't fund that for adolescents and adults. So I walk to the nearest health facility to get vaccinated against hepatitis B. And unfortunately, this term is not available for me. But if in contracts, there are a whole lot of pharmacies around me, which means every five minutes I walk out there, I could easily see a community pharmacy, right? So which means that it's easily accessible at that point. So if this is easily accessible, and if I compare with the a primary healthcare facility, for example, where it's not easily accessible, which means if I can, I don't get vaccinated, it becomes really frustrating. And if down the line, I end up contracting hepatitis B and developing the liver cirrhosis or cancer, I end up dying from it. It's access that actually caused that, which is painful. But with a community pharmacy, we are easily, community pharmacy is easily accessible. We've, we've tested the mobile vaccination service We've tested the walk-in clinic. I'll tell you that uh, proximity, that's convenience, access, has very high priority in patient deciding, in clients deciding to get vaccinated or being compliant to vaccination. And pharmacies already have the structures. They are open for long working hours. Uh, pharmacies don't even, don't even uh, you don't have to pay to actually even have a consultation service. You understand? So th these are uh, our structures uh, the community pharmacy already have in place. Also, in addition to that, the ambience, the environment, you walk into a community pharmacy, uh, well touched air condition, you feel relaxed. They, they, this form of, you're, you're well welcomed, right? Compared to, I've seen certain pain, when I talk with them, certain clients, they will say that, wow, I can't go to the primary healthcare because, the dirty environment. They will tell you well, but they can't see it when they are there, right? Like the environment is so dirty. I, I don't want feel comfortable there. I can't go there. You understand? So which means the environment is not even welcoming. You, you get. So another distinction thing is the accessibility. Pharmacies are easily accessible. They're open for long working hours, right? Practically, this increases chances of people getting vaccinated. It could also be leveraged in even the COVID uh, scenario, right? It could be leveraged because I've interacted with a whole lot of persons. They say, why don't you guys do this? Um, 
because I can't go there and wait for hours, long waiting time. I can't, I can't. If that is the case, I may not even get vaccinated. So which means the, the pain associated with wasting your day or spending an hour getting vaccinated compared to the risk of getting the COVID, that is even greater. So when designing solutions, what I still look is the benefits and the features, you understand, of such service, which uh, pharmacists uh, are in best uh, position to offer. So also equipment, pharmacists already have all what it takes to offer vaccination service. They already have, they, they maintain uh, insulin, anti-glaucoma medications within the uh, recommended temperature. So if you could store insulin, why can't you store vaccines? Most vaccines are stored between two to eight degrees Celsius. You understand? And even for inactivated this thing, most vaccines, single dose via comes with a vaccine via monitor, which helps us to assess the effect of heat on the vaccine. So that tells us if the vaccine has been exposed to excessive heat, uh, that it can be used. So with these structures in place, I think uh, with equipment, but you know, Lamarck's theory is there. The theory of use and disuse. If you don't use something <laughs> indirectly, you, it, it becomes, you won't know you have it. You understand? We have all what it takes uh, to start offering vaccination services, except the zeal and the will to. You understand? Except the zeal. How do we spark that zeal in people to say, uh, you could actually do this? You have all what it takes. You understand? How can we? The more important strain of pharmacies is the, the spread. Global, uh, nationwide, you, can, you, you can't count the amount of the number of pharmacies we have. I'll tell you basically that um, cancer don't kill by remaining, in, remaining a tumor. Uh, cancer kills by actually carrying out what, what we call metastasis, by spreading, you understand? Spreading to other parts of the body. Coronavirus, as little as it is, is creating headlines every five minutes because it was able to achieve a negative scale, which is spread. So when we talk about social impact solutions, pharmacists are already in a position to scale because they are already, they've already scaled, but they're not seeing this power in numbers. They're not seeing this power in spread. You understand? You are all over everywhere in Nigeria. Every five minutes you see a pharmacy. So how can this be leveraged to offer vaccination services by making it easily accessible, making it more convenient for people? You understand? So till we could see all that, we will know our strengths, you understand, to solve the problems. So what are our weaknesses? I, I, I hear a lot of, um, there are a whole lot of, uh, of, of like I say, there, there are people that focus on their weakness. Like, they are like pessimists. They always see the glass half empty instead of seeing the glass half filled. They'll give you 2 million reasons why pharmacy students offer vaccination service. I'm not even talking about the whole money making aspect of it. But I'm talking about how could we make life better for people in society? Leveraging the structures we have. We already have the, the strengths like um, pharmaceutical care, our philosophy, our mindset, ability to build relationship, accessibility, equipment. Why don't we focus on all that, the spread we have? Instead, we're focusing on a law that is not even dead as a pharmacy student. You see the elder, there are some minds, especially when it's, uh, we have such pessimists in leadership position in anything, uh, any profession or even a country, it becomes a problem, you understand? So why don't we focus on, on building the strength? It's easy. I don't have the knowledge. They will tell you, I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the skill. Oh, I did like cram la in school. So I don't have that. I've forgotten the administration skills. Lamarck theory, you didn't use the skills when you were taught. So it's called the law of use and disuse caught up with you. But all these things will be built, for example. That's why we, for example, we are in Oakley, we try to empower as much persons as we have, uh, we, we can, building their skills on vaccines, building their knowledge on immunology, vaccinology, administration skills, cold chain management. We try as much as we can to do that, to empower people so that it could help others prevent diseases. That, that's part of the core we do. Sometimes the third week of April, we'll be having other trainings for pharmacists around the first one between uh, January, February. So that skill can be acquired. Why not focus on the strengths that we already have to actually get this done? You understand? Then what are the opportunity? They say, like I said initially, coronavirus came with a lot of disadvantages, but it also came with a whole lot of opportunity. You see companies like Zoom are, are, are breaking even, they are, they are making headways 
they took advantage of the coronavirus, right? Why not globally in the UK and the US, though pharmacists have been vaccinated, but now it's glaring why pharmacists should be uh, not just playing a role in storing vaccines, not just playing a role in educating communities. But right now, pharmacists still administer. There is already glaring that these guys are needed if we are to solve this problem, if we are to achieve herd immunity, the pharmacists should administer vaccines, right? But there's no law, don't get me wrong, that says you shouldn't in Nigeria. But pessimists would always see the glass half empty, you understand? So how could we overcome this uh, set, uh, disadvantage as regard of our psychology, our thoughts, that we can do it and leverage the strength we have to actually achieve this. Other opportunities and strength we have, we have a lot of premises in, in politics and research and advocacy and social impact. The best way I can say we can do this is when you start, because uh, Albert Spencer will tell you that the main aim of uh, education is not just knowledge, it's action. You've been trained, you've been educated, act, impact people, change the environment, touch lives, gather the data while doing this. That data is what would help you to speak. You don't speak with words, you speak with data, you speak with numbers, you understand? It's when you touch lives, you can use that data to back your advocacy. We already have premises playing roles that are knowledgeable in advocacy, policies. Take those data to them to impact, you understand? So we have those strengths. These the opportunities right here before us is left for us to, to unnest it. There's nothing that can be, they say freedom is never given, freedom is won, you understand? So from my own part of uh, forces of analysis, there's what they call the competitive rivalry. Nobody will want you to do something just like that, you understand? So uh, professionals feel threatened, right? They see you as a competitor because they, they don't focus on the patient. They focus, they, they do what we call, what I call personally money-centered care instead of patient-centered care, you understand? So if you do a patient-centered care, we become collaborators, right? But if we do a money-centered care, you become a competitor. So uh, as pharmacists, we shouldn't look at life from that lens of uh, competition, you understand? But naturally, we have competitor out there. So what I would say to bypass this, you, the, the power belongs to the people. When you serve the people and you serve them well, they will join you in your advocacy, you understand? That's when you could, you could actually create real value, real impact through your vaccination programs from education to administration, to storage, to distribution, right? If you could do that, you use the data to advocate. You don't use words, like I said, even certain forms of lobbying are just vain. They don't get results, you understand? You use people to advocate because like I would always repeat, the power belongs to the people, you understand? You get like, um, we should be ready to engage in what uh, later uh, Senator John Lewis would call the good trouble, you understand? Uh, there would always be people that hate you, they don't like you. Despite you saying, I'm doing this to save lives. I'm doing this to help the patient. I'm doing this for the nation. You understand? This the, the quote I could, I could contribute to actually uh, combat this uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic and other infectious diseases. There are people that don't want you to do that because they don't uh, want you to interfere with, 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 their, with, with the patient. But I'm saying, if you actually are in the best interest of serving the patient, you will see that I'm also there. We can collaborate to do that. You understand? So those are part of the threats uh, we feel uh, we, we, we should look out for, but uh, with the people, when you solve real problems, there are people that, that, that tell me that, oh, thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, doctor, for doing this. I'm so glad, I'm happy about that. And I'll tell them uh, I'm a pharmacy. So really, what? So pharmacists uh, do this, you guys do more. You just found that, right? That way I've been able to rebrand uh, the profession into their long-term memory that pharmacists could do more than what they're doing, right? So it's left to us. Like I would always say, the time is now uh, to create a positive impact in the lives of people around us. The time is now for us to rebrand the profession as much as we can. The time is now to offer real patient-centered care and not money-centered care. And I will end with this. I always say that no problem is too small to create a challenge and no solution is too little to create a change. So it's left for you to go out there and create a desired change we need in the vaccination space, you understand? Go out there to help people prevent diseases. It's, it's up to you at this point 
you have the strengths, you have all what it takes, but all you need to change is your mindset that I could do more to help people achieve the desired life or health outcome they want via vaccination, you understand? So in some, we have the strength from the spread all across the nation. It's a fantastic uh, business model, social impact business model that could help us contribute a lot to the profession while making money with purpose. In addition to that, we already have the equipment in place to store any form of vaccines. Dry ice is currently being used for like the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. Dry ice is being used for, since we use the AstraZeneca, the normal refrigerator between two to eight would work. We have that. Our philosophy, we're trained with a great mindset to build good rapport relationship that will lead to trust. And once patient trusts you, you could administer a vaccine to them. They will listen to you when you educate them. You've been doing that. It's nothing new. You understand the accessibility. You are very accessible any day, any time. So why don't we leverage our strengths uh, to create the desired outcome uh, we want in the life of Nigerians? So thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Fam Emmanuel. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your knowledge. Um, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to listen to you today. Like you said, this was um, a discussion. So we do have a few questions. So please would like to know, first of all, and these are some questions that were asked when we put out the registration link. So there may have been um, questions that you have touched on during your presentation, but would still like to ask them just in case, especially because of the people who might have asked them, they might not have been there when you mentioned them. So the first question is how in Nigeria specifically, how are vaccines stored to ensure that they retain their efficacy in your experience? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks very much for asking the uh, question as regards storage. So there, there are different types of vaccines, you understand. We have the lyophilized like, yeah. powder vaccines, such as uh, chicken pox, MMR vaccines. Those are vaccines you reconstitute and uh, administer subcutaneously. Those ones could be stored uh, below two degrees, right? But majorly all vaccines can be stored between two to eight degrees Celsius, except the uh, coronavirus vaccine now uh, that requires special storage condition like the uh, Pfizer vaccine that is around uh, 70 degrees, then the Moderna around uh, 20 something, you understand, minus. Those are those mm -hmm. ones that require special uh, storage. But generally, all vaccines can be stored between two to eight degrees Celsius. So for example, if you are in a community pharmacy and you have a real solar powered um, refrigerator or refrigerator, you, you, you can assure that you have uh, power, electricity, light. You understand, and you have a special yes. refrigerator where you store vaccines. This should be different from where you store other uh, Temulaba uh, products, you understand, specifically for vaccines, and you know mm -hmm. you have electricity. Once you're, you have a digital thermometer that could monitor, or what we call a data logger now, data logger that could monitor the temperature between two to eight degrees Celsius, you can store your vaccines there. It's, it's just the cool temperature, you understand, between that two to eight. Once you can have that revision of power, yes. you can store vaccines. And the question still goes, have they been storing insulin? We already have the equipment to do all this. You understand? Sure. So that's how you store vaccines. But just that, yeah. um, that's why, for example, if we are doing training, uh, you have to, you need a data logger, which is more for, from my mobile phone, I could uh, look at the temperature of the cold chain. You understand? Then also you should know when to defrost the refrigerator. You don't have to um, ensure there's a way, there's a process we go about that when we teach people how to go about defrosting it and all. So that it doesn't start altering the temperature of the refrigerator. Also there are sections to store vaccines uh, so that it doesn't freeze the vaccines. But we also do training on what they call the shake test so that you know if a vaccine is frozen, you understand? And those are things we hold uh, hold to know. Capacity has to be built in that uh, areas. You understand? But generally, most vaccines, even the lyophilized powdered vaccines, are stored between two to eight degrees uh, uh, Celsius, just like your other uh, yeah. temulabi uh, uh, medications, like insulin, anti glaucoma medications. Yes. 
All right, thank you. So we'd also like to confirm, someone else has this question. Um, are pharmacists allowed to administer vaccines in Nigeria or is there like a proper training we have to go, we have to um, attend or some program have to take separately to start administering vaccines? So uh, basically, uh, what I always tell people is right there now, there's no law that says pharmacists can administer vaccines. Show me the law, you understand? Uh, what does that yes. mean? Yeah, you're not doing something bad when you create an impact. <laughs> nobody would, they say, no, nobody would kill you for doing, even uh, at a point when uh, so, uh, someone was healed on Sabbath day in the Jewish religion, right? I mean, why would you do that? You get, I think that was somehow countered <laughs> because it was a good act, right? It wasn't a bad act. Yes. So what we need to do is, is not there. Nobody say you can't do. You understand that nobody say you can do you get but what you yes. have to do now is to advocate to put it that you can do using data you understand you have to start that's how the americans started you understand the britons that's how they started you understand but you need knowledge like we for example my organizations we build people in the knowledge uh, the knowledge because the major thing you need when you come the educating people is the knowledge if, if you can view, educate them more, they trust you easily, you understand? That's a key thing, the knowledge about yeah. the vaccines and also the route of administration, how to reconstitute, you need to know all that, how to store, you need to be empowered on all that so that you do it, you solve the problem well, gather the data, that data, we should not transfer it to um, our researchers, you understand, and uh, people into policy and advocacy to use it to advocate. That's how when pharmacy started playing a role in eradicating, uh, combating influenza, reducing the debt as a result of influenza in the US. Those were the data they used to advocate. You don't advocate by lobbying like that or using mere words. You use numbers. Numbers don't lie, right? So that's yeah. this. Um, administration is not, uh, uh, is once you have, you, you have the skills and you have the knowledge, <laughs> you do it, you understand, gather the data and write that law. You use you have to write that law, but nobody's stopping you right now. You understand because yeah. the law is basically not there. But when I say pessimists, people create two million reasons why they can't. But me personally, yeah. I, I'm known to be involved in good troubles. You understand because I believe mm -hmm. uh, I'm not satisfied with things I see in society, and I have all what it takes to change it. So why don't I change it? And your patients, when you do this well, people you serve are by your back. You are building a force, right? And when you come out yeah. and speak, they'll say they'll be by your back and support you. That's when you offer real value. You understand? They're not doing it for the money because when you do good, the money would always come. You understand? So yes. these things are lengths. Like I said, for example, we are doing the, our second, we are doing the third quarter of our trainings now. Will be the third week of April. We do that. We will train from coaching, management, general knowledge in vaccines, vaccinology, uh, to even administration. And all we do all that. So once you have that, even the sales and marketing, which is very important, these are practical skills. Once you learn them and you practicalize them, like I said, knowledge is for action. Uh, education is for action, not to, to keep it a certificate or to write in your CV you receive training in this. No, it's to impact lives. That's what we believe in. So we don't even try to empower people that, that won't act on it. You understand? We empower soldiers, yeah. people that go out there to use these things to combat these diseases. Frontliners, you understand? That's how it works. So that's not an obstacle. Be an optimist to know that you could acquire these skills and create the desired change. And don't see the glass uh, um, uh, half uh, empty. You understand? See it's uh, half filled, and you get so that's. Uh, I think that's it for that. Thank you, thank you so much, Doctor Emmanuel. Please, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you could put it in the chat box. If you have any questions, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Doctor Emmanuel, you were saying you. In your presentation, you, we mentioned, you know, how access is one of the problems and you use the example of the hepatitis vaccine. And, you know, you said the power does belong to the people. And if anything, COVID has brought the, the attention of, vaccine, of vaccines and vaccination back to the forefront 
of everyone really so it's not just about covid vaccines people are also thinking about vaccinations in general so what how do you believe that especially when when you have anti-vaxxers because they exist and we have to acknowledge that they exist and they can impact the thought process of other people how do you what practical ways do you believe that individually and as a body really of pharmacists we could spread the word to the people in power, number one, because no matter how much we try to do things in our little shells, we can always push it to a bigger platform. So the, to the people in power to, um, and also to the individuals who are still kind of shaky about vaccination. Okay, thanks very much. Um, like you said, we can't do the fact that, uh, like I say, always say, people would always counter you. <laughs> there are forces naturally in life. So whenever you're trying to uh, do something, always uh, create that, that the people that will hate you, people that won't like you, people that will kick against you, right? It's normal because they say the easiest route to, to mediocrity is trying to please everyone. So there will always be people like that. So for the anti-vaxxers, vaccine assistance is one of the easiest things to um, tackle. Is the, the root cause of that is lack of trust. So how do you build trust? It's forced by establishing relations. So practically, I would say this is the way we do it. I've got, gotten to notice that naturally, I don't know what is our culture, uh, people are shy even when they, they, they get vaccinated. I, I've seen that in the field that I would interact. Okay, mm -hmm. just say you've been vaccinated. They will share it on your status. They will like, no, you understand? I'm shy, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Uh, okay, last week or there, but I got vaccinated for COVID. Then someone who we vaccinated said that she needed to get vaccinated. So I linked her up to uh, a police hospital where she got vaccinated. So she said after she got vaccinated, I told her to share it. So she shared it in our own network and she said what she got was insults. You understand? Like, yeah, you, you are not thinking. But let me tell you this. It all falls down to ignorance. You understand? My mom always told me then that ignorance is like a weed. Always uproot it anywhere you go. You understand? So that's why I say that even if I try to open my mouth to speak, I try to ensure it's the truth because... Uh, like I said, the philosophy of education is truth to induce people to open their minds, right? So the best way to combat anti-vaxxers acknowledge them. They are who they are. <laughs> you can't change them. But this is the problem about them. They are like the uh, white fire. People love sharing negative things, right? So when they craft those uh, negative messages, it spread faster than the positive ones. At the other extreme, we're having positive people that believe in vaccines. They know how it works. They are well enlightened, well educated. But they are shy to share these things. You understand? Not by getting Buari vaccinated. People don't trust the government. So you can't use them. That's the wrong approach the government is using. You understand? They don't trust this only who you trust. So that's why I said the pharmacy is the strong force here. Only if we could do more education with our client that already trust us. You understand? Then we can build a force where people actually share their positive experience i've gotten vaccinated i'm still i'm still here like when i got vaccinated a man was saying i think they say if i get vaccinated i'll be thinking like bill gates i want to think like a billionaire now you understand it just cracked a whole lot of jokes around that so this is the thing to combat first recognize anti-vaxxers there's nothing much we can do about um, the anti-vaxxers movement than to control what we can control you understand and what can we control is the people who already have a form of influence uh, around, right? Uh, people that we have influence that we've, they've been seeking healthcare from us. They trust us enough. We already have that rapport with them. Those are the people we can control. You understand? Build a force around these people as much as you can. Those are the people that will spread the gospel. You understand? They are the people that will spread the good news that, no, this is fine. I got my shots. But mind you, there are people that just talk. You understand? Tell them to go and give vaccine. But they won't yeah. because basically they don't understand. It's ignorance, lack of knowledge. You have to know so that you can give, you can share. So let's first build the knowledge, then build a force of people who trust and believe in us. You understand? Those are the people that could actually pass the message within their cycle that there's nothing bad about this. So that's how you combat uh, vaccine, uh, uh, anti-vaxxers you get. That's the only way. They have the money, yeah. they have the force. And psychologically, it favors them. People tend to share bad things than good things, right? In a situation where you have people shy to share something that is good, what else? We need to think more, right? 
So that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel, for that. Thank you for all of your knowledge and your time you have shared with us today. I believe we have our work cut out for us as pharmacists regarding vaccination and starting out because we're really still at the bottom tier of where it is right now. But I believe that now that we're having these conversations, this is the first step. Once we start having these conversations, we're moving on to solutions from bottom to the top. Thank you so much, Fam Emmanuel, for your time. How may we reach you? How may we reach you uh, once yeah. we want to? Sorry, we have yeah, one anyone... more question. Apologies for that. Okay, we have a question. Um, Okay. Yes, from Manuel, you're saying something. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you said as a question. Let's address that first, right? Okay, all right. All right. So um we have from Victor saying, I, I understand that we shouldn't be scared of getting vaccinated, but how do we relate with the report with the report of lethal adverse effects of some of them? Okay. Um as a pharmacist, there's a uh, number one, you did pharmacology, definitely. All drugs or vaccines are poisons. The difference is the dose, right? It's the dose. So I, I've vaccinated a whole lot of persons in my organization. We vaccinate a lot of persons. So I manage your expectation, right? I already know that. What are the four cardinal signs of inflammation from pain, swelling, redness, uh, fever, right? Those are normal four cardinal signs. So if it's not all... Um, Adverse, adverse event, nice, when you can relate with it too, right? But before I get to vaccine, I already know the vaccines. That's why I say your knowledge comes into play. So I manage your expectations. For HPV vaccine, I will tell you from the start, you're going to feel pain, muscle ache at injection sites. So how do we, how do you manage that? You could apply uh, 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 topical gel, like Lofnac gel, diclofenac gel, right on there. You could take uh, analgesic like paracetamol to to help uh, relieve that. You understand? Then for chickenpox vaccines, where we have uh, a live attenuated uh, virus being injected, you understand? How do I fever might come out for that because it's, a, it's an attenuated? I usually expect that, but it's not everybody that would actually uh, experience all this. But you manage the expectation before time. So ma, is advice I get baby vaccinated? on the weekend, if it's like a shy that needs to go to school, you understand? I schedule that to fall in the weekend where there are more, the shy don't have to start feeling feverish in school. You understand? Then how do we solve that? Take paracetamol because first, they might be swelling at the injection site. For COVID vaccine, when I took, I experienced pain at the injection site, I experienced fever. But I knew that chances are it might cause all this. So you, you already know your signs of inflammation. So you educate the patient based on that. And there's nothing without side effects. We should always know that. There's nothing without side effects. And from my own experience, I've never seen adverse events that the person is reacting crazily. That's why as pharmacists, you are key when it comes to history taking. You take detailed history. You collect the patients, past medication. Have you reacted to this? Do you react to any drug? You react to any food. You take the history. When there are people are saying, if you react to things, don't take COVID. But it's normal now for all vaccines. You ask all those, you collect the patients. You understand? There are some that say they reacted to sulfur drugs and all that. So when you know that, you now know patients you could vaccinate. That will, there won't be any problem. For those that are out of fear, they develop maybe syncope. It's a simple something now. You raise their legs, blood flow to their head. They are up again. You understand? So there's no really... Uh, crazy adverse event that you can't think of how that happened. You understand? If it's a pain at the injection site, as we say with COVID and HPV vaccine, it's there. You tell them how to solve it, to manage their expectations. If it's fever for this uh, COVID on the same headache or blood clots, if you know blood clots, for me, before I do, I took aspirin. I'm still alive. You understand? I took aspirin in case of any, you understand? You, because uh, there's no much data, right? There's no much data. They're still gathering data, which we know. This is if you understand clinical trials, you know post-marketing surveillance is key. Once a drug or vaccine is in the market, you gather as much data as you can continuously, right? So these are normal things. What we're having here is uh, maybe generally in the medical space where you see healthcare professionals being vaccinated, it's because of knowledge. Let's clear the ignorance. We clear the air. 
we increase the impact. That's just uh, what I can see for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fam Emmanuel, for giving us such detailed responses. Um, as, as we're saying, please, how can we reach out to you? How can we reach out to inoculate? Do YPs have the opportunity to come to train with inoculate? Hello. Okay, yeah, I'm um, sorry. I was on mute before. So oh, I would okay. drop our, our email. I could drop my email. Then we have the our co-head facilities or someone in charge of that department. But I'll drop my oh. email. You can send us an email. Uh, send me an email. Follow me on uh, LinkedIn. Just state what you need and the purpose behind uh, why you want. Because we are building a force, actually. It's not just pharmacists from nurses. We, we believe in collaboration. So we are training yeah. nurses. Um, uh, we have a whole lot of nurses on our team. We build their capacity too. And we still train our pharmacists uh, as much as we can. It's something we have been pushing for even before the COVID. You understand? So basically, send an email or reach me on any channels, especially LinkedIn. Uh, you could reach me on LinkedIn, send an email. Also, WhatsApp, I will drop the contacts to be reached. Uh, or just contact us. Uh, we take things from there. I would tell our head pharmacist to still follow up on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fam Emmanuel. And now we have come to the end of our first session. Thank you so much for a very insightful session. All right. So we'll take other questions after the second facilitator because um, we are... Time is, our time is well spent. Thank you so much, Fam Emmanuel, once more. Yes, yeah, so we have our second facilitator. We're going to the second session now, and the topic is COVID-19 vaccines in focus. Our facilitator is Fam Ezine Onwekwe. Fam Ezine has amassed over five years of experience in health systems strength, strengthening and healthcare supply chain management. She obtained a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree at the University of Nigeria in Suka. She currently serves as a public health fellow at the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where she has been coordinating COVID-19 preparedness and response activities, including facilitating capacity building in the 10 member countries of Africa CDC, Southern African region. She is keen on bridging the knowledge gap among healthcare professionals. Thank you so much, Fam Isni, for your time. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There's a bit of an echo there. So sorry, I had two devices on. So, right, so good evening. It's okay evening. now. Yes. Yes, it's fine now. Okay. So unfortunately, am, am I supposed to show my face? We would love that. We would appreciate that, yes. So that is my face for those who wanted to see my face. Anyway, so let's let's get to the business of the day. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. We still have that echo going on. Yeah, let me take the device off. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're good now. So uh, I can share my screen. Yes, please. Okay. All right, so you can see my screen, I guess. Yes, we can. 
So let me make it full screen. So I decided to do uh, my, the previous speaker spoke from the heart and that was a conversation, but being that this is a bit technical, I thought um, having some slides would put, help put things in perspectives. So today um, I'm not a vaccine expert. I have just been doing my bits and within Africa CDC supporting the response. And since the vaccine started, I've been supporting the vaccine coordination efforts as well. So um, I just thought that as pharmacists, it's important for us to make whatever decision for ourselves and for our clients from a place of knowledge. So you understanding really, there are a lot of questions. There's a couple of questions that were asked, that was asked to this previous speaker. And that shows that some of us even aren't exactly sure we want to take this vaccine. And if we are not sure, we're definitely not going to try convincing anyone to take the vaccine. It's not that there's enough vaccine for everyone, but uh, you've been, we all are frontline workers. I saw a question asking if you as a pharmacist is a frontline worker. Oh yes, you are a frontline worker. One of the frontliners of the frontline because you interact with people every day, you give essential services. So this is not to try to convince you or preach to you about the vaccine. This is just for us to understand what exactly the COVID-19 vaccine is about, address some of those questions we may have, all those issues, those small things that are keeping you on the fence so that you can decide, oh, I am for this or not for this. So to start off with, um, I'm going to do, this is just an overview of the, most of my, comments are going to be centered on Africa because that is where we are. So, and of course I work for an African Union organization. So we are Afrocentric. So when you look at the COVID vaccines, about um, seven have been uh, approved to an extent or given authorization to an extent. And you can see the platform, there are four platforms which we'll talk about later, the whole inactivated virus, the viral vector, the protein subunits, and the very controversial genetic code uh, vaccines. So when you, you can just see on this spreadsheet like this, the overall efficacy of each one, how many doses each one needs, the interval, one dose is taken after the third week, and the story, someone was asking about how he stored the vaccines. So for COVID-19 vaccines, all of them, except the genetic code vaccines, can be stored at a fridge temperature of two to eight. So, uh, and then we have, um, some of them have been given some um, authorization from WHO, from FDA, from um, the European Medicine Agency. Some have just been approved by a country. But then within Africa, when that's why I tell people, we're not just taking vaccines as, oh, they're giving us vaccines. Countries are also evaluating, doing their own internal processes to make sure that, is this okay for us? Is this okay for our situation here? Which vaccine works best for us? And you can see a number of countries have started um, giving uh, approval for, for the vaccines that are being used in their country before they import them. So you can see the situation for Sinopharm, Sinovac. I'm going to be using these names throughout the, the, the presentation, the AstraZeneca, Gamalea, that's the Russian one. So just remember that for efficacy, WHO says once the efficacy is more than 50, it's good to go. That is a benchmark for efficacy. So let's look at the remaining three. Actually, actually, there are four vaccines that have been, well, three, because Novavax hasn't really been um, approved. They just shared their phase three data. It's not being used yet. So you have the Johnson & Johnson, which is the only one that is a single dose. And like I said, all are being stored between two to eight. 
except for the genetic um, mRNA vaccines where you have the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna. And those ones, uh, the Pfizer is stored at minus 80 degrees centigrade and uh, the Moderna is stored at minus 20. So three have the bleach or emergency use listing, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, we have Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca. And WHO is still evaluating the rest to give them up the approvals. So uh, just a bit about that. And then about storage, um, the, fridge, the ones for fridge temperature can be stored at that for three months. For up to three months, you can keep them in the fridge for two to eight degrees centigrade. Um, but then if you want to store them longer, like the AstraZeneca, you have to store it at minus 20, it can last for two years. But then the Pfizer one, which is uh, at minus 80, can be stored at fridge temperature for five days. And the Moderna can be stored at fridge temperature for one month. So these ones that are very, very cold chain can be stored at fridge temperature at very short days. So, just a bit about that. So this, the individual areas of this presentation are going to be uh, what we're going to talk about. So this was just giving us an overview of, of it all. And you can see for Nigeria, Nigeria authorized um, AstraZeneca. I think that's the only one that Nigeria has authorized. Yes, just AstraZeneca. All right, so this is a lot, but it's just to give us a picture of where we are as a continent. Do not think that people are not vaccinating. The orange color are places that are being, uh, the vaccination is going on, and the yellow is where they receive, but they're not still vaccinating, and the gray is where nothing has happened at all. So you can see now that almost 45 countries, at least 40 countries are vaccinating out of 55 countries. So it's something impressive. Africa has joined the vaccination bandwagon. And in as much as there are glitches, the vaccines are not enough, it is happening. And, and I'm glad that uh, at least it started in Africa. So these are some, I'm going to share these slides with you. These are some, um, some maps, some applications you can use to get information on who has vaccinated, where, what, for Africa. The first one is from WHO for Africa, who has vaccinated, what kind of vaccine are they using? And then the second one gives you information on number of people vaccinated. So, and the last one is on the status of so many, there are up to hundreds of vaccines in preclinical in pre trials. And so it gives you information on where they stand, where have they moved to, where have they been done. And for the vaccinations, countries are getting from COVAX, which is a collaboration with WHO and a lot of other partners. AVAS is the African Union Vaccine Tax Force. And then there are also bilateral arrangements where either China donates, India donates, or you buy from China and India. So this is just a snapshot of vaccine acquired, which vaccines are being used where, so like I said, the, the countries get, the continent is getting very colorful. J and J is only in one place. So things are moving and this is uh, amount administered uh, in, of the vaccines. So yeah, and then target populations, mostly healthcare workers are being tar targeted, but then people with comorbidities are also being targeted because they stand at risk of getting, they are high risk of um, getting COVID and people who are older and essential workers or frontline workers like you and I, and some places prisoners and immigrants uh, and refugees are also being vaccinated. So this gives us an overview of, of what, uh, who are the first phase people, these vaccines we are getting now. Where are they, uh, who are they vaccinating in the countries? So let's get, I've given you some figures, numbers to tell you that vaccination is really going on in the country, in the continent, not just Nigeria, it is really happening. So now we're going to move to the more technical part of this discussion, which is trying to understand 
how the vaccine works, what are the safety and efficacy profiles of these vaccines, what are the questions being asked, what can go wrong, what can go right. So like I earlier mentioned, for COVID-19 vaccines, there are four mechanisms that are being used. And these, some of these have been used to make other vaccines. So the whole vaccine approach is using a killed or weakened vaccine to spark a, an immune reaction. The viral vector vaccine is using an inactive vector or virus particles act as a Trojan host to deliver the genetic material from COVID-19 virus. The subunit vaccine is using a piece of the virus fast surface like the spike protein to deliver the message to the body and then the body now creates immune reaction to that. And then the last and the controversial one is genetic code vaccine, which is RNA and DNA vaccines, where you use raw genetic material to achieve the same goal of, of making uh, our body cells to protect, provide um, immune reactions. So this just gives us a bit of mechanisms which I've explained which vaccines falls under where the pros and the cons. So as you can see for the, we have Sinopharm and Sinovac, which is now being used a lot in Africa, um, are the ones that are made from weakened or inactive uh, vaccines. So they're a bit difficult to manufacture, but they have been traditionally used for the flu vaccine, for the measles um, and rubella vaccine. But the thing is that they take time but they are very successful. And that's what Sinopharm and Sinovac um, has used to create their vaccines. Then the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson, the Gamalaya use the viral vector where they use a, a, part, a particle, a different vaccine as a vector to introduce bits of the COVID-19 genetic material in our cells. And then when our immune system sees that, it produces uh, an immune reaction which is the end product of vaccines. So for these ones, they can be designed very quickly. And what well, the problem is that people who uh, are immune to the vector, it might not work for them. The vector that was used to put in the, the as a Trojan host to put in the COVID-19 genetic material, it might not really work for the people who are, uh, and they're using the adenoviruses, which is rampant in Africa. So it limits its uh, ability to protect as much. And uh, the, so that's that for that. Then the, the next one, that's, that's also what was used to make the Ebola vaccines. So the next one is Novavax, which hasn't started to be used, but it's in the pipeline for approval. So what they do is on, on you know, when you see the COVID-19, uh, picture COVID virus, it has spikes. Those spikes are called proteins and those proteins can be harvested and used to make a vaccine that when we inject that into you, your body recognizes it as COVID and makes generates uh, an immune reaction for that. So, but it's, it's still to produce because of the process of harvesting the proteins and all that, but it's, it, it, it works. So most childhood vaccines have been made with this um, process. So the genetic code material, like I said, is the one that we all, when they came out newly. And, and the problem with the conversation around COVID-19 vaccine is that these are conversations that should be happening in the academic community. But right now, everything is on the internet. So once we had genetic code vaccine, no, they are going to change your DNA and this and that. No, it is not. What it's just doing is, is using the genetic code of the virus. And that's an instruction manual that says, make COVID-19 antivirus. That is just what it is. It doesn't alter your genetic DNA. It doesn't do anything to you. It doesn't change your body. All it does is that it's once it's, it, that's, it tells your body to make a protein. Once your body senses that protein, it activates an immune response. So they've never been used. This is the first time they're being used outside research but they can be made very rapidly. And that's what Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna are using. 
So like, this is just what I explained, the different the ways they work. So viral vector, RNA, the whole virus, protein subunit. So you see the ones that just trigger an immune response directly, and you see the ones that walk through um, the messenger RNA or the spike proteins. So this is just more pictures of what I've just explained. You have the slides and you can actually go through this for better understanding. And this is for the mRNA vaccine to show you that nothing is going to rot, walk up, attack, attack your DNA. It has nothing to do with it. It's the messenger RNA that does the job and helps produce that um, immune reaction. So what's the next step? We've understood at least a bit how these vaccines work. Once you get a vaccine and you establish it's efficacious, and then we start going towards approval, which some have gone through. And once it's approved, we start manufacturing, vaccination, what's next? So these are different steps of, of this whole process. It's, an, it's a cycle because there's going to be a second wave and then vaccines. But when you look at the last column where you have future directions, is it safe in the long term? We have to continue assessing whether it's safe in the long term. We have to see if it really gives us immunity. If there are mutations in the virus, is it going to protect us on that? There's a lot of vaccine hesitancy from everybody. It doesn't even have to matter whether you're educated or not. Everybody is hesitant from all fields. They're all hesitant. So it's, in, it's a continuous cycle where we have to get back to the beginning, keep explaining. And the thing is, you know, the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine was, was um, made very quickly. And this being made very quickly does not mean that it doesn't fulfill or it didn't meet all the criteria. It didn't go through all the stages. It definitely did. So when you look at the clinical trial stages, you have the preclinical, which is when you're doing things in the lab with animals and all that. And then you, you ascertain that this can actually regenerate an immune reaction, at least in those animals. And then you get into phase one. In phase one, you give to a small number of people to see how safe it is. And that's when the safety profiles are being checked. At what dose is it safe? And then also to see how well it will induce an immune response in people. After that second dose, you have more people from different backgrounds, different health statuses to ascertain how safe it's going to be in a larger community. So it still gives you information on side effects. And also if you increase the doses with the immune response increase, you know, generally more information and also gives an initial information on effectiveness of the vaccine. Phase three is when we now really look at efficacy how effectual it is. Out of the 100 people we gave, how many people did not get COVID? You know, that's the, the, the conversation that we'll be having uh, at the phase three. And then if it passes that, and it shows that it was able to protect people from having COVID-19, you have to start looking for authorization and approvals um, in, in, in the long run. So you can see there's so many vaccines that are still in different stages and they all went through all of them so it was quickened because there was a global need there was an urgency but that doesn't mean that things were not done well things were done well just that one there was a lot of manpower available for the work there was a lot of funds available for the work there was an urgency so all these things combined to make sure that these vaccines came out as soon as possible and Looking at the efficacy, when even when we have established that a vaccine prevents people from falling sick or it protects them from getting COVID-19, we have to still continue with effectiveness. So when we roll it out, you have to keep studying it. So even now it's being rolled out, and that's why you're having those studies and you're having follow-ups, and people are reporting, oh, there is a blood clot here, oh no, there is pain on the side of the So you just keep continuing to roll out, as in to follow out follow up the rollout uh, in the real world, outside clinical trials. And, and that's when you see, oh, is it really as effective as we thought it was? So it's, it's, it's a continuous process to study effectiveness, but efficacy is established. And then that could let you decide, oh no, we need to reduce the dose. But you have to also look at 
this if if one if you're having one side effect out of one million people is not really significant. So you have to look at the numbers as you're as you're doing the the rollout and the effectiveness in the rollouts. So um, I decided to just pick the top seven uh, vaccines that are being used and just give us a bit of more history on uh, their efficacy, the safety effects, uh, safety profiles as well. So we'll start with the Pfizer BioNTech. As you remember, that's one of the RNA virus vaccines. The efficacy for all ages is 95. But you have to remember that Pfizer is the one that is frozen at minus 80. So not many countries have the facility to be able to roll out uh, such a, a vaccine in country. So it decreased the risk of moderate to severe COVID-19 disease by 95% and reduced the hospitalization by 100%. Then um, when it comes to safety, it also there's local pain, local injection site pain there is pain at site of injection. So like the former speaker spoke, this is something we have to let people know that you expect it. That I felt pain does not mean that something is wrong. It is expected in this vaccine. So I think those who are vaccinating people should actually take a minute or two to counsel people and say, you may feel pain, you may see some swelling, you may have fever. It doesn't mean that the vaccine is bad, it's just, one of the side effects of the vaccine. So, but most times you these things resolve within two days, within seven days. And for for Pfizer, the most commonly reported side effects after the second dose is still the same injection site pain, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle pains, joint pains, fever. So these are the common ones. So uh, reported, and I think that's the same for for the Moderna as well. The Moderna and the side, the, the Pfizer have similar safety profiles, so it's still the same pain at this injection site, fatigue, headache. So I think it's important that when people are going to be vaccinated, that we let them know that this is expected. It's going to resolve in the next two to seven days. And uh, then moving over to Moderna, the efficacy is 94.1 efficacy, which is almost similar to the Pfizer. And so that's the two for the messenger RNA vaccines. Then for the Johnson & Johnson, which is a single dose vaccine, it's um, efficacy of all, across all ages is 66.9. So, but you have to remember that this is one of the vaccines that was, uh, was produced after we started having um, variants. So it was also tested in South Africa, where we have the uh, prevalence of the B151 variant, which was first discovered in South Africa. So it decreases the risk by for efficacy in South Africa was 64, which is not bad. And for the US was 72. So across the regions everywhere, overall the efficacy is 86%. So the, 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 this also experienced the local injection sites. So for this one, the adverse effects is injection site pain, headache, fatigue, myalgia, nausea and fever. So it's all similar that you take these vaccines, there's a tendency that you might have one of these side effects. Then for Novavax, um, there were two trials also trying to look at the, the South African variants and the UK variants. And in the UK, the overall efficacy was 89.7%, 14 days after the first dose. And uh, but efficacy against the wild type, like the original COVID-19, was 96.4. But with the South African variant, with the UK variant, it dropped to 89.7, and with South Africa, it dropped to 55.5. So you can see the effect variants have on the vaccines, and um, and what that means for the future as you continue to get more variants of concern. So for local adverse effects, you have pain, redness, 
tenderness, swelling at the site of injection, but then systemic adverse uh, effects. The popular ones are fatigue, muscle pain, myalgia, headache. So you can see that these are similar across board. The common ones are similar across board. And that's the same for the Sinopharm. So Sinopharm is uh, 79.79% 79 effective against COVID-19 and it's 6% effective in the trial done in the UAE and it goes from ages 18 to 19. So the side effects are also similar. They have headache, flush, swelling, rash, itching, uncommon erythema. Adverse, uh, systemic adverse reactions that are very common is the headache, the fever, the fatigue, the muscle joint. So you can just see all of that. They are really, 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 really since, since, uh, very similar. So for the Sinovac, the vaccine efficacy is 91 point, sorry, the Gamalaya, the vaccine efficacy was 91.6. And um, it's even higher in people who are older than 60 years. So the most adverse, if common adverse events where feel like illness, injection and site reaction, headache and asthenia. So the adverse effects of our advice is that you as a pharmacist, as you're encouraging people to take vaccines, let them know that you're going to feel this and that. There are some rare adverse events, but generally everybody will feel the common ones. And so for the AstraZeneca, which is a popular one that has been used in Africa and is also being used in Nigeria. So efficacy was at um, 70.4 after two doses and 64.1 after at least one dose. And AstraZeneca gives interval of eight to 12 weeks before you can take your second dose. In fact, the longer your interval is, the more, the greater the vaccine efficacy for you. So that's why people, you take one and then the next one, you might take it in the next two or three months. So um, the adverse events are the same thing, the local pain and set of ejection and all that, and then um, systemic reactions. So I picked um, something from the leaflets of AstraZeneca vaccine, and you can see the very common ones are headache, nausea, uh, myalgia, atragia, injection site tenderness, pain, warmth, bruising, fatigue, malice, chills. So it's, it's the similar thing. The things that are common are vomiting and diarrhea in some people. So decreased appetite in some people, lymphadenopathy in some people, but those are uncommon. So you can see it's just the same across board, similarly for the injections and it should be expected if you're feeling any of this. So how do we ensure on, uh, that we have a vaccine safety strategy? So as pharmacists, who should actually be getting involved in this vaccine vaccination drive? We have to use established systems to prevent heightened safety monitoring for COVID-19 vaccines. We have to develop new platforms and leverage on other federal data sources to complement existing systems. We have to communicate clearly on the vaccine safety process and systems and also provide data. So you have to also do our own part, even as a community pharmacist, to have some sort of way of tracking um, safety of vaccinations, people who are coming to your pharmacy, have they been vaccinated? How did they feel? So you're also trying to do pharmacovigilance. We know how Nigeria is, but we can also do our own part and give that, um, you know, support and leverage on all this to also position ourselves as custodians of vaccines. So, um, Let's talk a bit about the supply chain part of the COVID-19 vaccines, the storage and all. So in humanitarian supply chain, we have upstream and downstream. Upstream is the manufacturers. And for COVID-19, UNICEF has been central to the supply division and then the third party logistics. And downstream is where you have warehousing, storage and distribution. So looking at this, we know that vaccines are part of, 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 
of the medications kept on cold chain, if you're not kept within specific temperature range, they will lose their potency and strength, and that means they will not work as such. So if a vaccine is supposed to be kept at a particular temperature, it has to be kept at that particular temperature. And if they are not, this is called temperature excursion. And that means that their quality has been compromised and might not be, 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 be good. So cold chain is maintaining a consistent temperature across upstream and downstream operations in the pharmaceutical operation. And it's essential that we don't break the cold chain. So there, of course, these have been shipped from very far away, from China, from India, from you know Korea, Japan. So we we have to make sure that the shipping process was kept was the right one, and was uh, kept cold all through. So it can be active, passive, or hybrid. So active thermal ones are those huge ones, you know, something like. The, the cold fridges, the cold cooling trucks, the cooling vans and all that. The passive thermal shipping ones are when you have gotten your vaccine, you know when we go for vaccinations or we put them in ice packs or we have some cooler boxes, you know, for the vaccines. Yeah, that is the passive thermal shipping systems. And sometimes there are hybrids of this. So it's just some examples in the bottom, left, you can see those big fridges there that are used to truck. And in the upper right, you can see the cooler boxes that we use for vaccination drives. So there's something called thermal monitoring devices, which we also already use in our pharmacies in the fridge to make to measure what uh, if the degrees are being kept. And sometimes in vaccines and in vials, there are ways, visual alerts that tell us if at some point this went below or above the temperature it was supposed to be stored at. So if you see those indications, maybe it has turned from white to black, it means don't, don't, it's light. It has turned from blue to white, you know, it's, there's are ways you have to look at the vial and see ways to make sure that you're using the products that has um, that is useful and, and has potency. So there are so storage types, how are they stored? Someone had asked that question. You can store in the fridge, you can do component storage in the warehouse, in freezers. You can also store in your cooler boxes. You have refrigerator trailers that help move. You have walk-in fridges. You know, there are so many things that we can use to, to store these. Some of them are fixed, some are portable as the need may be. And then there are facility monitoring devices like I mentioned earlier, which sometimes you can see it by a fridge door or we can see it as we enter our pharmacy to tell us what's the temperature in the pharmacy to make sure that the drugs do not uh, get, it doesn't get too hot for the medications in the fridge or for the pharmacy. So, how do we ensure an, an equality and risk management of, of vaccines? You have to, there are three things. Um, we have the set of international regulations, the good manufacturing practice, the good storage practice, good distribution practice. So this means that the regulations and processes driving manufacture, storage, and distribution of pharmaceutical goods is up to standards. I'm sure we've heard of this before. And these are the things that help us to manage, to ensure that there is quality and risk is managed in uh, while distributing the vaccines. So some risks to be considered when dealing with temperature sensitive commodities like vaccines. One is temperature, definitely. We need to make sure that the temperature is consistent, all true. But there are times when you're offloading, you're transferring, you're handling, you have to make sure that it's as quick as possible or it's done within the cold uh, system. If it's with ice, you package with ice or do it somewhere chill so that the temperature um, doesn't get out of the range. And transit duration as well. So when we have the thermal shipping containers like those refrigerated trucks and all that, you need to plan time for your for your 
products I think into consideration the weather the all of that so when you're packing you make sure you assemble it with refrigerants buffering materials the cargo itself so that it's not jarred like when you're driving something doesn't come out of place and the shortest time make sure you keep to the shortest time as possible in offloading and un unloading so I was talking about shock and vibration before so you know glasses and these vaccines are made from glass and the syringes and all that. So they have to be packed in such a way that the vibration and shock does not jar them or break them. Or So we use nested trays. If you've seen the package for some vaccines are nested, they are sort of like pressed into some trays that restrict movement. The same with the vaccines as well. And you have to make sure to manage humidity so that products do not become contaminated by mold. So these are some examples of the nested trays that we use for vaccines and, and the, the injections. And lastly, once contamination, don't, don't carry things that could the smell of products or oils together with vaccines so that they don't get cost contaminated. So that is all about um, majorly how vaccines are stored. We've talked about how the vaccines work, what kind of vaccines are being rolled out on the continent, how they work, their safety and efficacy profiles. We've talked about storage and stuff like that. So we want to now just look at questions and clarifications and misconceptions that you could have as some questions I've received when it comes to COVID-19 vaccination. So one, what's the deal with pregnant women? Should they be vaccinated or not? So Pregnancy puts women at higher risk of COVID-19, So, but we don't have enough data to say, yes, they can be vaccinated, no, they cannot be vaccinated. So if, if, if uh, a lady is pregnant and the benefits of vaccinating her at least the potential risk, please go ahead and vaccinate. So they, they, because pregnant women are constantly coming to the hospital, they are exposed to cause SARS-CoV-2, they may have comorbidities, so it has the risk of their disease. So let them be vaccinated in consultation with their healthcare providers. The same with breastfeeding women. So they are part of a group actually for prioritization for vaccination. We do not, I mean, don't discontinue breastfeeding, keep breastfeeding, but the breastfeeding mother should be vaccinated. So who are the vaccines not recommended for people who have history of severe allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine should not take it. And also for people less than 18 years, we don't have uh, data for people less than 18 years, but Pfizer last week just announced that uh, their vaccine is safe for 12 to 15. Moderna is doing trials for 12 to 17, but both of them are also doing trials for six months to 11 years to see if there's a need to vaccinate these children, if the benefits outweigh the risks. So people who are immunocompromised, can they take the vaccine? Well, you already, your immunocompromised state is at increased risk for COVID-19. So you may still receive, they should receive the vaccine under counseling. You have to talk to them and find out what their drugs are they on, what do they react to, unless it's contraindicated, then they don't. If not, they should receive the vaccine. Does the COVID-19 prevent transmission? We know that it prevents you from getting it. I mean, for your body fights and you don't get COVID-19. But when I'm taking the COVID-19, does it mean that I cannot transfer the vaccine? I cannot transmit to somebody else? So right now, the information we have is that it appears to help reduce. And how we can help reduce transmission is by reducing the viral load in, load in the vaccinated person's nose. So for me, if I've been vaccinated now, even if I come in contact with COVID-19 and it's in my nose, you know, I've inhaled it, the COVID, the vaccine helps my body fight and reduce the viral load. So with time, there's nothing to transmit to somebody else. So we're still following, um, do you still doing studies, like I mentioned, effectiveness studies to see what happened following people up who have gotten vaccinated you know they it's it's an ongoing process but vaccinated people should still that's why vaccinated people should still continue to wear masks and physical distance so if i've had covid19 before can i get vaccinated yes 
regardless of whether you had it before, you should get vaccinated. So we don't know how long you're protected. COVID-19 is not one of those um, viruses that you have it once, you don't have it again in your life. We've seen people get infected again um, after being infected the first time. We've seen people getting infected with the different variants. So you're still very vulnerable, even if you've had COVID-19 before. So, but you can wish to defer, at least give yourself time to two, three months after you've had the COVID-19. It says so children below the 18 years, they should not take the COVID-19. So how, how long does protection from COVID-19 last? We don't know. There's a lot of we don't know with COVID-19 because it's new that we, they were still following people up. We don't know how long, but we know that this is a virus that has caused serious death for people and is still killing people and the benefits outweighs the risk. So it's better for you to be protected until we find out how long. Is it two years? Is it three years? We actually don't know. So experts are working to learn more about natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity, which is what we are going to get now. You know, natural immunity, you have measles once, you don't have measles again. But now vaccine-induced immunity, does it last as long? We don't know. So and protection is not immediate. If you take it today, it doesn't mean you're protected today. You have to give yourself two, three weeks after you've gotten your second dose to consider yourself fully vaccinated. And that's why we keep telling people, mask up, that you've received the vaccine does not make you, I'm now a superman, I'm a superwoman. No, you still are at risk. It takes time for the protection to kick in and we don't know how long the protection can last. So do I need masking after being vaccinated? It depends. For now, if you're fully vaccinated, you can go outdoors, you can interact with people who have been fully vaccinated as well. So if I'm fully vaccinated, you're fully vaccinated, we can have a conversation without mask. If uh, I'm fully vaccinated um, and you're not vaccinated, I can go around you know, without mask, but you who are not vaccinated, needs to keep wearing your mask. So people need to still wear a mask six feet, you know, do the usual protocols, especially if you're with people from unvaccinated um, areas or people from multiple households. So what is emergency use authorization? I wanted to talk about this because I've been talking about it before. It's not the same as approval. So what most of these things have, these made vaccines have is emergency use authorization. And this is a mechanism to facilitate the availability and use of medical countermeasures, including vaccines during public health emergencies. So allow you to use unapproved medical products some of these vaccines don't have approval, global approval yet, but you can use them in an emergency to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious illnesses. So this is what they have. They are still on their process of being given full approval, but they've been granted emergency use authorization to combat the, the outbreak. So what is the plan for monitoring COVID-19 vaccine? So it's not because they've given them authorization, everybody will now request relax, no. The manufacturers are supposed to have a plan for active follow-up. So that's why it was easy to pick out these instances of blood clots, instances of severe side effects, because they are still following people up. They did not hands up because they've gotten the EAU, EUA. They continue to follow people and that's going to inform the benefit risk. At some point, we have to decide, yes, there are side effects, but does the benefit outweigh the risk? Are we going to have more people dead uh, if we do not have the COVID-19 or can we save some lives in, in all of that before they are given? So this is a, a continuous and that's the, the process called effect, checking effectiveness. So, so for example, this is what it is with WHO emergency, emergency use listing or pre-qualification evaluation process. So the, the countries submit their data from their clinical trials to WHO, to FDA, to um, European Medicine Agency, to those authorized um, approval agencies. And then there's a whole process of, you know, 
when they approve. So you can see that some have been given approval. The AstraZeneca has been given approval. Um, the uh, the Johnson and Johnson has been given approval. The Pfizer has been given approval. So we have others. They said most of people, most of them by media pro will have feedback on whether they've been approved or not. And this will make it easier for other countries to approve them because these people go through the data, detailed, the details going through of the data to make sure that uh, everything is in place. So I want to just talk about new strains and blood clots because this is, we can't have a conversation around COVID-19 without talking about this. So one, are we having new strains? Definitely. What are the best strains of concern? So the B117 is the one first identified in the UK. There are other variants like the B1351, which is identified in South Africa, and the P1, which are the originated in Brazil. There are more mutations going on, but these are the ones that have given us concern because they seem to cause more severe cases of COVID. They are making COVID more transmissible. And that is what drove the, most of the second wave in, in the southern part of Africa where I am, is the B11351, uh, the one from South Africa, is the one that pushed cases. Transmission was high, younger people were affected. And so these three are the three variants of concern that we are looking at. And we have to think of how to adapt vaccines to match variants. So um, someone from Oxford vaccine group was talking, he said that for the RNA vaccines and the viral vectors is relatively straightforward because you can, these use DNA. So you can synthesize a bit of the DNA and then insert it into the new vaccine. So it's easy to do like a version two of their vaccines for the RNA and viral vectors for to, to match the new variants. It's going to be a bit of work, but then it's the same process they've been using, but just that they'll have to modify now the DNA, the mRNA DNA that they put in the vaccine to um, be able to address the new variant. So of course, they will do some testings in animals, in humans to show that they work and then approval will come. So these are just some things, there's some processes that are already going on uh, from Moderna. Moderna is trying to create a variant matched vaccine. So you have the East variant, if it's the B1351, you have a vaccine that just attacks, that works for just that one. If it's the one from UK, you have a vaccine that just matches that one. And then the Pfizer BioNTech are testing a third dose of their mRNA vaccines to assess how well it's going to be in light of the emerging variant. So they're, they're tweaking their vaccine a bit and going to give it as a third dose to see if it will improve the efficacy against the variant. And there is a new vaccine coming up called CureVac. CureVac is making vaccines targeted at the, the variants. So you see things are happening. It's a, it's a continuous process. As, as we roll out, issues are coming up and we're doing things to address those issues. So now for the block court, this is what the European Medicine Agency has said. I remember that most of the countries that halted or stopped the vaccine were in Europe. So this is what they said. Um, you can read, so among the 30 cases, so they, they had vaccinated 5 million people and the events were reported in 30. So that is 0 0.00006 per 100 individuals. And the question now is, does the benefit outweigh the risk? Is it protecting people enough for us to look at these figures? I know these 30 people are human beings, but then in the long run, looking at the big picture, is it better for us to continue? And they said, yes, that uh, at, at the moment, with the information, because they had to review all the information again to see if there was something that they missed. Is they've not been able to establish that the blood clot is linked to the vaccination, so that's the issue, and it's not significant enough for it to be, you know, linked.
to the vaccination. And so that's the same thing that the WHO is also saying. They assessed the, the Global Advisory Committee assessed reports on the AstraZeneca and it highlighted the EMA statement that there's no indication of a link between the vaccine and blood clots. And so investigation is ongoing. We're still looking at data. We're still looking at people who have been vaccinated. Was there something else? Was, does it have to do with an age group? Does it, so this is something that, but well, we cannot stop the vaccine and because we are not sure. For now, the vaccine's benefit outweighs the risk and will continue the vaccine. And this is what AstraZeneca themselves have said, that they, they reviewed available safety data for more than 17 million people vaccinated in the EU and EU, EU, UK. There's no evidence that this, you know, of increased pulmonary embolism in, in, in any particular country. And so it's just that no issues. It's more of saying that this is not related to the batch of the vaccine deals in Europe or across the world. So thank you very much for your time. And that's all from me. I'm open to questions. I know I've answered some of the questions that were directed to me, but if you have other questions, I'm open to taking them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fam Izini, for this expansive presentation. This was actually really, really detailed. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions. So um, I'm going to bundle them just because um, time is far spent. So we have one from Fam Akonde Aziz Alao. With the dwindling incidence of COVID-19 cases, won't Nigerians have excuses to not take jabs? Also, are there any special studies on side effects of vaccines for populations? Do we also have the opportunity to give people access to more options as, for example, not just the AstraZeneca, so that people can choose the vaccine they want to take? For starters, that we are not that we are getting non fewer fewer number of cases doesn't mean that COVID is going. It just means that we are not testing enough. So I don't look at those figures because I know that we are not testing enough. There are states that are not even doing tests. There are states where you can't do a test even if you want to do a test. So that is not a clear picture of what's going on. So and other question about um, choosing the vaccine you want. It's not that easy because you have EPI um, programs uh, on immunizations. So they're the ones who look at, um, you're the ones who look at what can the country take? Because even if you want to take Pfizer, you have the money to take Pfizer. Can your country maintain the cold chain? They might not have the cold chain system to do that. So that's why people are going for these vaccines that are fridge temperature. So it's not a one person's decision. It's looking at everything going on in the country. Can we take this? Is it possible for us to really roll out the vaccine using this, using this uh, Pfizer? We can't because we don't have cold chain. Even if we have cold chain in some places, we don't have in other places. So they look at that, analyze that and say, okay, no. This is, we can't do this, this is what we can do. So for now, you are the mercy of the country. So. All right, so basically the we don't have country. the option to pick what mm -hmm. we want right now. No. All right, thank you. Yeah, we hasn't gotten to that point. To that point, yes. So, okay, Um, in order for vaccines to get to more people as possible, can we leverage community pharmacies currently, since they seem to be the first port of call in many areas in Nigeria? I, I feel so. I really think, I don't know how this is being done in Nigeria, but pharmacies should be at the forefront of this, really. Pharmacies should be, I know we might not let community pharmacies um, roll out for now because of how things are done in Nigeria. But I feel that hospital pharmacies should be at the forefront of this vaccine issues. I really think so. I don't know who is giving the vaccines now, but 
But it starts when people know you can give value. That's like what the previous speaker said. Sometimes we are looked down on, and sometimes we assume things because that, that's what our predecessor said. That's what these other people said. They said, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. Says who? Why can't you start doing your own little awareness on vaccine? And that's when you do that, people see you have value. Because I feel people come to us first. If there's any question, you come to buy a Panadol, or you ask your pharmacist, ah, this vaccine they are giving, is this safe? Can I take? You know, and that's how conversation starts. So I feel pharmacists should be at the forefront of, of, of all this, really. They should be. And we actually, we actually do agree. Um, pharmacies are actually not, to the best of my knowledge, not at the forefront in Nigeria when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccines. And that's why the question came up. But hopefully something does get done. We are able to do something about that pronto. So um, we also want to ask, are there any drugs currently that we know people react negatively to, may react negatively to if they take the COVID vaccine while taking those drugs? Oh, I don't know, but if you're for people who are immunocompromised, if you're you have to have so if you're taking some drugs that are immunosuppressive, you need to talk to the person who is vaccinated. You need to explain and say, I am taking this drug because uh, you may not you may contradict. But majorly other drugs, you don't have any problem. But also this should be given, I think like 14 days interval between vaccines. If you're taking any other vaccination, give like 14 days between that vaccination you're taking and this vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccines. So um, th that's, that's just that. All right, all right, thank you. So I, basically we have, um, we don't have as much information right now regarding that regarding that because it is it's just rolled out is that what it is exactly right exactly now? yeah of course we'll, we'll know with time but we advise to at least people who are immunosuppressed suppressive and take immunosuppressive drugs please make sure you say before you are you're giving yes all right thank you so um our final question regarding this is in your experience what tips can you share with us to that we can help educate other people on the importance of the vaccines uh, including healthcare personnel because even some healthcare personnel are still um doubtful regarding the covid vaccine you, you just have to first of all understand what is their problem and face it according to what their problem is is there a problem that it was done fast explain to them that you went through all the processes. Is there a problem that is a genetic one? We don't even have the genetic one in Nigeria, so that should not even be an excuse. Before people were saying, oh, it will change my DNA, to change my... We don't even have the, the supposed one that will change your DNA. So why are you worried? Why, why, are, you, why are you worried? And, and also, you can explain that the same way these vaccines are made is the same way the Ebola vaccine has been made this is the same way the flu vaccines have been made. You know, explain to, to them in using what they understand for what they do not understand. Because before, we don't usually don't have conversations around vaccines. We just told, take vaccine, we take. But all of a sudden, we are all now experts and everybody is telling you, oh, this vaccine, this vaccine, this, whether they understand or they read it here, they did not read it there, whether they understand or not. So you just have to first of all find out what exactly is your issue with this vaccine? And then start from there and explain to them. Do not barrage somebody or berate somebody that, oh, no, 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 you don't. No, 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 you're behaving like an illiterate. No, no, no. Just try to understand that this is new for everybody. So not everybody even get an opportunity to take the vaccine. Ask them, what is the problem? What is your issue with this mm -hmm. vaccine? And then from there, with the information you have, explain to them. Yeah. And and I saw something in the chat about vaccine passports. Yes, we are working on that in Africa CDC. The same way we have travel passports, we are trying to come up with a vaccine passport. There's something called the Trusted Travel Platform that we use for people who are traveling now with COVID-19 um, results. So once you use the same for vaccine passports, 
as well so that people have their vaccine passports as they're traveling and it's authenticated. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. That was actually our final question. Thank you so much, Pam Izini, for your time and for your knowledge. Please, how can we reach out to you? Hello. Do you have my number? Uh, I believe someone does. I, I don't have it, but I know someone on the Okay, team I can put in my LinkedIn. Let me put in my LinkedIn. Yes, that would be great. To me on LinkedIn, it's in the chat. You can always connect to me on LinkedIn. Oh, sorry. To Thank, everyone. You. Thank you so much, Pam Isni, on taking us on this beautiful, beautiful presentation on COVID-19 vaccines in focus. And also, Dr. Emmanuel, you're still here. Thank you so, so much for your time, for your knowledge. We appreciate both of you for what you've done for White Peace today, this evening. It's quite inspiring, really, that you're giving your time and your knowledge so freely. We really, really appreciate it. Fam Emmanuel Obayomi is our state coordinator here at PSN YPG Lagos, and we'll, and you'd like to say a few words. Ooh. Okay. Sorry, can yes. I just Maria. say something? I have a question. Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Why, how are pharmacists engaging the primary health care development, development so whatever, those people who are coordinating the vaccination? How are pharmacists engaging them? Yeah, because sometimes it takes a group to make an effort to be because I, I I see is they are the ones in charge of the vaccination. I see the data yes, coming from are. them. So are you engaging with them in any way to see how you can play a role in the community? Collaboration. My knowledge. I mean, I'm not in the position right now. This is PSN YPG, so we are the young pharmacist group. We cannot um of our own volition go there really because we have other bodies ahead of us we have the psn the pharmaceutical society of nigeria we have the pcn so the best way for us to come in is to relay this message to them because we cannot take that stance alone so but to the best of my knowledge and i stand to be corrected really we are not involved yet in this rollout this ongoing rollout and that's part of why we're having this conversation to see how we can do something to change that so that it's not just that we're having another random webinar and in two minutes, in two days, we would forget what we discussed. So that's why we also asked you the question, how you think we can you know, leverage on this practically because we believe that something should be done, but we cannot do it on our own. We still need to get the approval of the, um, for lack of a better word, let's say older, our older colleagues, more like or the bodies that regulate us in the first place. So we'll have to get on that. Fami Manuel Obayomi, do you have something to say about that, please? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Desire. Thank you, Fam Desire. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel and Fam Izumi for the webinar and the sharing us um, your wealth of knowledge. Uh, for the for the role being played, actually, it's the PSN and the ACPN that are liaising with. Um, those in charge, we just get information from from them so far, to my best, to the best of my knowledge, and we get it through the national. So, the YPG national are the ones actually liaising with PSN and um, ACPM. So, whatever information that is available to us, they pass it down. So, we are not directly involved. YPG, especially for the state level, the national level are the ones liaising on our behalf. So that's what I have, the information I have now. Yes, for that question. Oh, I think Dr. Emmanuel wants to say something. Yeah, he wants to say something. Okay. Let me Dr. Let, Emmanuel, please, let... floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Um, for now, the, I, like I said, uh, we're in a very, a, we find ourselves in an environment where Things are just too complex because uh, we rather compete with ourselves rather than collaborate. So it's very hard getting things done at that uh, primary health care level. 
personally, from our own experience, uh, from the Lagos State on to the, I've been to the National Primary Health Care. I've engaged them a lot in several things, but they really just don't take uh, feedbacks, you understand? So for pharmacy, it's going to take a whole lot. But what are the simple things we can do? For when I went to see, because I have relationship with a whole lot of primary health care, I know the problem, the politics involved there, you understand? So what pharmacists can do, what I observed personally was you could play a major role, starting small, you understand, from advocacy. There are people that go there to take COVID vaccine. They already have the habit of taking pictures, taking videos when they are being vaccinated. Why can't we, like, for example, that's what I've been discussing with my team, have a movement whereby you get to interview these people, take the concept and share it on your platform, you understand? Nobody's doing that. When this thing, people have been interested in seeing such content, right? they have been interested. So when you take the concept, interview them, just like a box pop, like, what do you think about this? How do you, what's the message you have to tell others? When you are doing that on your own, you don't need the National Primary Health Care approval to do that, you understand? All you need is an individual, the, uh, the, the recipient of that particular vaccine, the beneficiary, right? So I think that's the role we could play as even YPs. That's the role. That's where you can start from. Because at the National Primary Healthcare, you know the majority of this person's their professional rivalry, they take it by heart. Why would a pharmacist come into with we've, we've actually look at, for example, let me use a realistic this thing, family planning. It took a whole lot of time before they started piloting programs, leveraging community pharmacies for HIV programs, uh, for family planning, you understand? They didn't want you to involve in that space. They rather use shoes, right? They rather use shoes. They don't want to give you, it feels like they are strengthening you more. So that's the problem we are having here that despite globally, we are seeing the impacts community pharmacies are making. Nigerian government chose to roll out plans, uh, not even involving them. And to make things uh, uh, bad, your leadership are not really playing a whole lot of rules. But what I feel is this, it's simple. You could start from anywhere you can. You understand, one man can create a change. I tell people all it takes is one man two shots to put an end to this pandemic. Who are those? How could we convince more persons, one person to take two shots? We achieve herd immunity, you understand? So that's just the role we can play. As YPs, you could start from advocacy by directly going to those, uh, is like engaging with persons that are already getting vaccinated. Talk to them, engage them, record those comments, and let them know that it's just a picture, a video, or something. Can we uh, video you when you are? How was it? Share your views. They will. They are so excited at that point. They will share. You create a platform where you promote all these things, and then you are getting engagement, right? Uh, publicity. Then, then you can take the engagement to another level, to another level, and all that. I feel that's the way we can and go about this, if not to just waiting for your, for the senior colleagues to go about it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think we have another. Is someone else raising their hand? Akonde Aziz. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Well, I think for the roles we can play as um, young pharmacists, I, in my own belief, I don't think we should wait for the elders because I, I don't know, I don't want to see these seem to be um, sleeping on it. What I think we can do as a group is um, we should uh, actually take some actions. And one of the actions I think or steps I think we can take is probably by actually going to these um, vaccination centers and taking information or getting details about these patients as a group. I'm saying because it, will be, it might be a bit difficult individually to actually you know, facilitate. So if as a group, we go there, take information, monitor these patients for side effects, for adverse reaction, we can even publish that. And it's a lot of info, it's a lot of um, impact. If we can get this side effect or monitor these patients for more months, two months, three months post-vaccination, what is happening? Are they okay? Then take this information, publish it, let the government see the role you have played as a group that, okay, this is what we've been, we've been able to gather from the vaccination they've done so far. They would next time they want to do something of that importance, they would engage you, even if they have not been doing that before, because they've seen that you are, you are relevant in bringing um, important things out of what it, you know, think is not important. So those, these are ways I think we should um, engage and not actually wait for others or, you know, 
take orders from um, elders or something. We are used, and this is sort of sophistic period. We should speak up and do things instead of waiting for you know people to give us um, directives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fam Malau. Fam Emmanuel, or by me. Uh, okay, I think th there's someone, there's Rose raising up her hand. Do we have time? Rose, okay. Uh, yes. Okay, Rose, we, we have. All right, good evening, time. everybody. Good evening, Rose. Okay, so I was thinking, and yeah, I remember when I was growing up, like as secondary school leavers, we used to partake in polio training and then we'll be carrying balls. To immunize, do some immunization and all that. Well, I was thinking that is there, is there a way farmers can attend the trainings? And because I know then you attend trainings, and from trainings, you take some little tests and then you are picked. So I think that's a way pharmacists can actually come in. If we know when the tests are going on, the trainings are going on, we can be part of the training. Like um, coppers, like co members can be part of the training intense and all that. So I think that's the way pharmacists can actually come into the immunization process. So I was just thinking, I was just, just a thought too. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. That's actually a great suggestion. Thank you, Rose. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, for the advice I've been giving, we'll look into it. Some, look, make sure that we, we as a group, and YPG Lagos will see where we can come in, even in the advocacy part. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. Thank you, ph pharmacist. Can you guys hear me? Yes, please. Okay, so, oh, I think she has left. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, and YPs, for taking out time to join this webinar. Thank you, from Desire, for moderating this webinar. Very well. Although I was in and out due to network problem, but at least to the larger part of the webinar, I got some insight. And truly, before the webinar, I was still a bit skeptical about whether to go take my vaccine, go take my shot. Should I tell somebody to take my shot, um, take, take their own shot? But I think now I am convinced. And I will also preach the message of, okay, go and take your shot. Go take your COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine shot. So thank you very much for this webinar. I truly gained a lot. And I'm sure others that attended also did. So um, thank you all. Thank um, I think that will be all. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and for your suggestions. So I believe it is time for us to actually practicalize this. And we will, you know, because um, there's a lot of talk and not a lot of work, but I believe that, you know, this is the first step to doing greater things. Thank you everyone so much for your time where, you know, we have passed the two hour mark and this is a two hour webinar. Thank you everyone. You can still reach out to Fam Dr. Emmanuel and Fam Ezine via their LinkedIn to ask questions, to just reach out to them. Thank you so much everyone for your time. Thank you to our facilitators. Thank you to my teammates in the education and training com committee. Thank you, Shipe, Victor, Everyone, have a good evening and enjoy the rest of the Easter holidays. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.